All right, we're beginning at this year's World Economic Forum, which wrapped up at the weekend in Davos, Switzerland, where the Vice President, Kashim Shetima, said Nigeria's uh, delegation was not there simply to beg, but rather to seize advantage of the pro premise uh, to dialogue with investors on a fair and balanced, mutually beneficial relationship. Shetima spoke exclusively, but arrived his anchor, Dr. Ruben Abasi. Honestly, I was quite uh, impressed with the outpouring of support by the global business community, which I've come to appreciate the permanent role Nigeria plays in Africa. For the purpose of perspectives, one out of every four black men is a Nigerian. And by 2050, we are projected to be the third most populous nation on earth. We will surpass the United States. Our population will be 440 million people. By then, one out of every three black men is a Nigerian. And by the end of the century, we will be the most populous nation on earth. Certainly, this is the most populous country in Africa and its largest economy. Wherever Nigeria goes, that's where Africa goes. And the trajectory of global growth is facing Africa, and Nigeria will make or mar that destination. Our presence was well received, especially in the light of some power reaching decisions taken by the present administration to also position the economy. Oil subsidy for successive administration has been an albatross round our neck. The president summoned the political willpower to remove the oil subsidy. And we know the consequences of unveiling a masquerade. That's a huge cabal that peace pack on the oil subsidies come. Look at the multiple exchange rate regime that provided room for a lot of shady practices. We collapse the multiple exchange rates, the multiple taxation. The president had set up a committee to synchronize our taxes and come up with a single line taxation system. So the global community was thrilled. We had had a lot of positive interface, positive interactions and very soon, our efforts will start yielding fruits. We are not a poor nation by any standard. We are not a poor continent. We want to deal with people on a pedestal of equality. We do not come to the West with a begging bowl, no. We want to deal with them on mutually beneficial terms because ours is the richest continent in the world. The whole country also of Europe their resources are not up to the resources in the Democratic Republic of Congo. This is why I said we carry our poverty with dignity. We are not here, wherever we go. That was the Vice President Kashim Shitima. Now, U.S. Minister of Solid Minerals Development, Adele Alake, says the ministry has begun investigations into the cause of the recent explosion in the Bodija area of Ibadan, noting that the government is awaiting the forensic result. In a statement released and signed by Shego Tomori, Special Assistant on Media to the Minister of Solid Minerals Development, Alake noted that while President Bola Ahmed Tinibu has condoled with the governor and people of Oyo State over the incident, his ministry has also issued a statement of condolence to the victims, recommending that Saka be provided for them by the Oyo State governor. The minister noted that he has also deployed the state mines inspectorate to the scene of the explosion to join other security agencies in unraveling what led to the blast. I'd like to clear the air on the explosion of any entity, noting that the present administration at no time issued a mining license to anyone or entity in Oyo State.
At least 134 people have been kidnapped in the last three months in the Federal Capital Territory. And this is according to Public Complaints Commission for the Federal Capital Territory. The commission claimed that the SET Minister Yesamwike has not been properly briefed on the high level of insecurity in the nation's capital. A rise correspondent, Tunjo Lanipeko, fired this next report. The commission says insecurity within the nation's capital has taken a disturbing trend with 135 people kidnapped within the last three months in the six area councils of the FCT. The Federal Commission of the Public Complaints Commission in the FCT, Delhatu Ezekiel, said this while briefing journalists on the high rate of kidnapping and banditry, saying that the FCT Minister Nyusom Wiki seemed not to have been properly briefed on the high level of insecurity in Abuja. The Commission is so worried because Abuja is the capital city of Nigeria, the mirror through which the entire world sees this country. And if we allow and keep quiet and remain docile with the happenings, it will consume everybody. As we speak, people are deserting their communities in the rural community, migrating to the nearest urban cities. And in the whole six area council, there is no area council that has not been ravaged and seized by these bandits and kidnappers, killing people on their farms, in their houses, in their shops, and all what me. It's very, very unbecoming, and I want to call the attention of the Honorable Minister to this ugly trend that is going on in the FCT. Following the fresh killing of four out of 11 abducted residents of the Sagwari estate layout in the Duse area of Abuja, including a 13-year-old student identified as Folorun Shaw, the PCC says it has received several complaints from both individuals and groups over abduction and killings by bandits. It says kidnappers are having a free day while innocent people are killed kidnapped and robbed of their belongings we need to engage and empower the civilian jtf because when it happens what we do is reactional we deploy security agencies they go there do operation and come back and these criminals have intelligence as soon as the security return back they go back to the other com in fact when they go to attack buari and we deploy security to buari they go back to kuje and left the scene in Buari and then distract the attention of the security agency to Kuje Area Council. And when we go after them in Kuje, they go to Abaji. This is how they are be jostling and playing with the intelligence of our security. The PCC commissioner also called on the FCT minister to declare a state of emergency on insecurity as the spate of kidnapping in the FCT is a major threat to peace and businesses across the territory. But a group captain, Sadiq Shehu, is a former spokesman of Nigeria Air Force and now a security and policy analyst. He joins me now uh, to look at emerging angles from the current state of insecurity in Nigeria. Uh, good evening to you and welcome to this day live, uh, Shehu. Good evening. Yeah, fantastic. Let me straight out, start with the issue, well, both of them bothers on security, but let me reel out to you what some retired generals uh, said, their advice, they said, no president, no commander-in-chief has given direct, definitive order to deal with terrorists or bandits decisively. No timeline to get things done. No consequences for failure to get them done. This is a retired Air Force uh, general making this statement. What do you make of this statement? Could this be the solution to this insecurity we're witnessing in Nigeria? Giving them a definitive uh, 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 marching order, timelines, and then consequences if timelines are not met. What do you make of that? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, in reality, you know, the, uh, the safety and security of citizens is not on the security chiefs, it's not on the service chiefs, it's on the president and commander-in-chief. It is expected in a democracy 
that the executive branch to a large extent and the legislative branch to a large extent should supervise, superintend and oversight the security agencies very effectively. And in supervising them very effectively, it means first giving them enough resources, as much as the economy can afford. Having done that, you follow the resources that is given to the security agencies, you give them timelines, and uh, unfortunately, I don't want to use the, uh, you know, the comparison, but it's just like in a football coach. I think we have reached a stage where the political masters have to start giving ultimatums to people that are in charge of security, reasonable ultimatum, not too uh, tight, but again, there has to be timelines for some achievables. We may not end the insecurity that started in Nigeria, for example, is not be realistic for the president to say in the next one month, I want everything to go. But at the beginning of this year report, and even since 20, 2009, there are monthly, there are yearly figures. I would like to see the president and through the responsible ministers, given the timelines, you came in, these are the indices. These are the number of kidnaps. These are the number of uh, Boko Haram attacks. These are the kind of banditry attacks. Even if I do not demand a full cessation of all these things, which is not going to be possible, give them a timeline. I want to see these numbers dropping. Unfortunately, for those of us that look at the numbers, you know, we are seeing, uh, there was a time we were seeing a decrease. But unfortunately, between the transition year 2003, 2023, 2024, what we are seeing an increase. Everything is, can be measured. You measure by the number of attacks. You measure by the number of people apprehended. You measure by, 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 by you know, the kind of attacks that have been uh, foiled. So there should be this. And I, to some extent, I agree with those uh, senior officers who made. In that, from the previous regime, with due respect, what we see is the president calling the security chiefs too frequently for meetings. Too frequently for meetings. In my own belief, the president and the commander-in-chief, when they say the president and commander-in-chief is calling the IGP or the security chiefs or the DSS, I think all of them are supposed to go there with trepidation. It means things are deterioration to such an aspect that if you go to that office, am I even coming out with my position intact or not? That should be it. But where the meetings uh, with the president become so frequent and there is nothing being seen in, as a, in terms of increase in, uh, in, in, in productivity and there is no uh, you know, uh, consequences for failure to reduce the numbers, then at a time the presidential summons will become so common, they will become so ordinary that there is nothing to even fear about or nothing to expect. So I want, uh, with due respect, uh, I'm calling on the present government that, uh, you know, when they say the president is summoning security chiefs, we need to see results on the ground. If results are not on the ground, the, the Nigerian public are holding the president responsible, and the president should also hold his security chiefs responsible. I think it is high time we start giving key performance indicators in terms of reduction in monthly figures, in terms of reduction in yearly figures. And this major, this, uh, you know, uh, figures should be measurable, should be visible, so that the citizens will have, uh, whether it is a reality or perception, the average Nigerian now believes, and we, the major decision, we also believe empirically that the security situation uh, is becoming uh, worse and worse by the day. We have to see an improvement towards finally getting a final stopping, if we can, of these situations. Now, I must also caution, uh, you know, uh, a tendency of uh, other people that are not living in the federal capital uh, territory to see us probably adopting a kind of elitist approach, security in Abuja, security in Abuja. The truth is that it's not only security that's busy, but I understand that Abuja being the capital is the eyepiece of the country, is the diplomatic capital of the country. So if you say secure, uh, Abuja is, uh, is, is besieged by insecurity, of course it will send the wrong signals because you expect the uh, federal capital, but at the same time, I want us while talking about Abuja to also talk about the security worldwide. So in essence, I agree with those officers in the fact that uh, the political masters, both in the executive and the political branch, they know the final ball is on their table. If there is success, it is them. 
If there is failure, it is them. And for that, they should also start setting key performance indicators. We have reports. We have both international and national uh, you know, uh, 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 think tanks like the beacon of uh, Dr. Kabir. They're giving us these figures. We should follow these figures and see them dropping. You can measure whether something is improving or not. Yeah. Okay, uh, Sarik. People do not hear this. Well, is Sarik, yes. there's a troubling trend which befuddles the mind. I mean, these are security agencies that are supposed to be have intelligence. But it's looking more like uh, the terrorists, the bandits, or the kidnappers seem to be ahead. You listen to that, that interview where the man said what they do now is that, we, that the security agencies do what you call reactionary. When they strike at Buari, the security people get there. While they are trying to handle that, they go to another part of Abuja and they move that way. Why is this so? Why is, is it that the security agencies are not able to track the movement of these people and get to be reactionary, proact get to be proactive? I will agree on one thing. Looking at the trend of attacks, when did the security agencies respond? we have to agree that the response time is unnecessarily too long. It's unacceptably too long. In most cases, I will agree that whenever the security forces react, it is after the deed has been done. In few cases, they are lucky to meet them or to thwart them. But in most of the cases, with due respect, it is after the work has been done. So we have to ask, what is it that affects the response time? The response time for any security or law enforcement action is dependent on three or four factors. First, the number of the personnel that you have that will be near to almost every location. Of course, there is a finite limit to which you can have numbers, but we all agree that the numbers are not enough to man these areas because the closer you are to a place, when there's an attack or there's a report, then you, your response time is going to be short. So the number of the security agency where have been saying it, whether it is military, whether it is police, is not enough. Secondly, mobility assets. Mobility assets, whether it is for the police or the, uh, or, the, or, the, uh, or the military or even the DSS, are they adequate? Are they appropriate? In the last uh, attack in Plateau State during the Christmas, one of the reasons had is that uh, uh, some of the areas are not accessible with the normal uh, 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 vehicles that the military or the police are using. So you have to think there are different kind of multimodal transport systems that can make a security agency to reach. So number of uh, 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 you know, uh, mobility assets and their appropriateness. Every terrain needs a different, probably a different kind of uh, mobility asset. Secondly, even, uh, thirdly rather, even if you have the numbers, how you deploy your forces is very important. We continue to shout, every IGP starts. I am happy for one thing that uh, uh, President Tinubu did, which I hope to see trickling down. It is related. He said that now his entourage for internal trips and uh, foreign trips has been reduced. That entourage also includes security personnel. Every IGP that comes says that he's going to reduce security personnel that are following VIPs. With due respect, there are even some people that don't even have public function, but they are still having policemen following them. So this is what I mean about deployment. If you have X number of police or X number of soldiers, but about 60 or 70 percent are on escort duty or VIPs, then you don't have the number that will provide the other general public. I want to see the, the, the president putting eye on this. It is not fair for a country of 200 million, then uh, you are putting disproportionate number of security people. Yes, they are important because they are holding uh, public officers, but I think we can, we can, we can, we can move back on that. All right. So Good. even if you have enough number, deployment. Then communication. Communication assets that will link the patrol team that is in Kubwa with the patrol team that is in, uh, in, uh, in, in Gerki or this. If there is no sound communication system, then it means which one area is besieged, you cannot call for reinforcement. So all these are issues that affect low response time, which is a fact of our security. This thing. The response is always coming late. Unfortunately, most of the response is coming just to come and count bodies and then take people to hospital. That is not what's required. So all these factors that I enumerated, you have to look at them to ensure that our, our security forces react. There are security forces in the world, maybe we are not there. 
that can react. They, if I, it's, it's something of training and policy. Hmm. If there's an attack in Kubwa, right. and the police or the military, you know, uh, uh, reacted in one hour, the people that are in charge will say one hour is not enough. Good. We keep Good. track. Next time we'll make sure we make it thirty minutes. Good. Let's let's take this. Let's take this further. Interesting. My concern, really, and of course, I'm sure uh, the concerns of Nigerians. What you have raised is what then is the meetings that are held over time. For example, the second issue you touched on, that there are places that were not motorable or didn't need... I, I, one would expect that in your security analysis and talks, this should come up so that, I mean, you're ready, you're prepared. If, if, it, is, if it is a truck that is needed, if it's a motorcycle, you are ahead of time. Add this to the fact that the ID has inaugurated what he calls SIS court, uh, uh, that is the uh, Special Intervention Force. This court is to engage in community-oriented policing. How is this going to help? Well, with due respect, uh, one thing I like the IGP that he did, which up to now, my colleagues in the military have not done. I heard him saying when he came, I have X number of policemen. And for me to be able to perform, I need to raise it by this number. I heard him saying that I cannot recall the numbers. This is what I expect all the other security agencies to do. They have not done. But having said that, since the IGP come with due respect again to him, you know, it has been launching one special squad into another, one special exercise into the another. But the pe what the people need to see is kidnapping, you know, reducing. Not immediately stopping, but reducing. So we've seen so many, you know, uh, special intervention squad, uh, the uh, uh, civil defense, they say they say have special women's squad to stop uh, school kidnapping. All this special, this special, that special, this special, that. Unfortunately, what people want to see is reduction. It's not special, this special, that special, that. So let them get the numbers, let them get the training, let them get the equipment that is needed. I'm talking to you, you said, why is it we cannot see what we need? Here, I have to throw the blame to the executive and the legislative branch. Uh, I just watched one program, I don't know whether it's a station, where somebody was extraying the 2024 budget. When you say you want your police to move sharp, you want your military to police sharp, when they bring a budget and you don't see, you know, provisions for adequate security, and then you see provisions for some frivolous projects. I say frivolous because there's, there's prioritization. For a country that is facing these security challenges, I don't want to see things like uh, we are renovating building. We are building university. I don't want to see such things inside the budget. But you wonder, how does this kind of budget pass from the executive branch to the National Assembly and it is approved? You should be talking that items that, first of all, increase the operational capacity of the security agents. Anything. The National Assembly, by the way, has the power. They are not bound to accept everything that the IGP presents at its budget. They are not bound to accept everything that the Chief of Army staff or Chief of Air staff or Chief of Naval staff present at his budget. They are representatives of the people. They have the right to remove money from here and put here. They have the money, they have the right. So it should not be only the military. The military do their work, but then the legislators are not doing their work. If you do not put, you know, prioritize what is important in a budget, you can even put the whole national budget in security and defense. Unfortunately, you may not get the desired result. So the problem starts from the budgeting. By now, we should have identified why are our security forces reacting. Is it a, a, a major of personnel? If it is personnel, okay, this is 2024. By 2026, how many do we want the police to be? How many do we want the army to be? Then you start tracking. When the police or the army bring their budget for 2025, you said, what did you recruit in 2024? Put more money in recruitment. Put more money in motorcycles. Put more money and so on and so forth. But unfortunately, the way we even scrutinize our budget, I follow it. The, the legislators will go on break. Then they will come hurriedly. Then between one week, they have passed everything. They have signed everything. I do not see the rigor. I do not see the rigor in checking the budget that I see in other countries. Um, democracy is uh, is an international, uh, you know, something. You have many countries you can you can you can just. We don't see them doing that. So if you don't do that, you budget a lot of money in terms. Yes, please. Let's tackle the issue of. Is it it, uh, mm -hmm. What I should use the word interesting. I mean, the minister of uh, solid minerals, Alaki, 
uh, again, we're talking about reactionary. This is after how many days? He says the investigations are on. Uh, I had some guests the other day. Who, they were talking about that same day the battle blast happened. We should have been seeing the pictures through drones. I mean, it, it was still the next day, even though the governor was on top of it. Now, he says the federal government did not at any time issue licenses to anybody to do mining in a battle. So apparently it's illegal. How did these people manage to get there, live in a residential building, have an explosive inside a house, and nobody knew? Thank you very much. A very valid observation. I am very active, by the way, on social media. When that Ibadan explosion happened, I was counting as a security expert. I want to see, can somebody tell us what is the cause of that uh, explosion for several hours? I can't remember. Maybe seven, up to ten hours. Up to ten hours, I can remember. Nobody could even specifically say, was this one caused by an IED? Is it explosive? Is it even an attack? by some uh, criminal uh, elements. It took us 10 hours. Then the governor came and said uh, it is foreigners that have, uh, that have uh, planted, I mean, that have explosives in the houses. And then the police, I remember also passing a statement that it is IED. So what does that tell me? Low capacity. Low capacity. Within that 10 hours, we are supposed to have experts that will give us an insight of what is happening. We don't have that. And uh, talking about uh, the law, which he said we didn't go. You know, I like, sometimes we have this tendency of uh, not taking responsibility. We are good to say it is foreigners. It is foreigners. Okay, it is foreigners. I want to believe mining or minerals exploration is a legal business. And a foreigner is allowed to come and prospect for such minerals. What the, min what the, what the foreigner cannot do, he is not the one to tell us the kind of laws and regulations we don't have. So whether you bring somebody from Mali, whether from France, to me, it doesn't make sense. If you have your house in order, this is how you are supposed to register. This is how you are supposed to store your explosive. This is how you are supposed to use the explosive. This is the kind of uh, magazine. In other countries, even the specification, the kind of walls, the kind of material, the distance from lodging, where you put your magazine, where you put explosives, all over the world, um, mining, mining companies use explosives. It is not something illegal per se, but how you store it, how you acquire it, how you are registered. How inspectors monitor it is there. When I was checking on this, uh, 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 I didn't hear what you said. The minister said they didn't give any mining. When, when I checked now, the license. Only, apart from the Nigerian Mining uh, Minerals and Mining Act, which didn't talk about anything about uh, you know how explosives are to be used, the only subsisting act we have is the Explosion Act of January 1967. 1967, that is two years after independence. And what that act did, it just gave us an outline of what we should do because it contained only two sections. The section where it said there should be a minister who is charged with explosive, who is supposed to give regulations as to the manufacture, importation, uh, handling, storage of explosives that are used for mine. From that 1967, all our subsequent governments and legislators were asleep. Because when you have such a, a very minimal legislation, what is expected is to give subsidiary legislations or regulations. I didn't see any in my research. Until 2019, when Honorable uh, Riba Shawulu, you know, passed another bill requesting for the repealing of this 1967, 1967 bill for the decision. He did a very good work because when I checked, there are, uh, you know, he even mentioned that it is Inspector General of Police who should be responsible for providing licenses. The Inspector General of Police also is to uh, appoint people that are called Chief Inspectors. And the Chief Inspectors on the same line, they are supposed to appoint inspectors for each area. Like this Ibadan, for example, according to that act, there are supposed to be an inspector in, 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 in Ibadan area who you will apply to for license, who will go and inspect where you are keeping your explosives, who is check your papers, and so on and so forth. We do not have that. Right. So, but the good thing is that I hear that the president, after the FEC meeting, have set up a committee, as was said by the Minister of Defense, uh, 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 former governor of Jigawa, Badaru, that there's a committee. But what this committee needs to do is to go and look at that bill by Honorable Shaul, because I think it has not been passed into an act. So the point I am making is that we are always reacting. Yeah. We have a bill, 1967, an act of 1967, 
That is the only regulation we have, whether somebody is from Mali, whether somebody is from France, that is the only thing that is holding him to do what is necessary. All right, before I let you go. purchase, storage, exportation of, uh, yes. Before I let you go, uh, they say you learn uh, through two ways, either through wisdom or experience. Wisdom is when you read the uh, literature other people have written about some subjects, you rub minds with them, you know what to do. Experience is when it happens to you, you learn. One is a little bit, this has happened in a battle. With all the, uh, you know, uh, all the talk around it, failure here, there, there. Are we really in this nation taking stock, learning from what occurred yesterday so we can better or forestall these things from happening the next time? A very valid observation, Mr. Charles. We are not a learning people. And what I observe with Nigeria, we cannot keep our eye, the whole country, including me, we cannot keep eye on two things or three things at once. When one incident happens, before we find the solution to the end of that problem, if another solution comes, if another problem comes, we leave that one and go. We started with uh, this year with uh, Tudumbiri uh, 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 collateral damage. As soon as uh, better, better, edu better edu case came, we left that one and followed this one. Now we are following a uh, 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 explosion. We we'll leave a explosion without finding the solution and move to security in, in, in Abuja. So the point I am making, while we are looking for a solution, one thing we need to do, we don't keep track. We don't learn lessons. We don't improve our... This. The America we call, the America we call, they have capacity for self-criticism to understand this thing is not working. And since it is not working, we should improve it. We don't do that. So again, what I'm calling on the federal government, it is good they set up a committee. And I always say Nigeria is blessed. Nigeria is blessed with human capacity. Whatever endeavor, you have experts. When you have a work, give it to the experts that are knowledgeable in that area to do that. This committee that is set up, I hope it will not be uh, you know, composed of committee of people who do not know how mine regulation, how explosive regulation are out. Within the armed forces, within the security agencies, there are experts in this field. I hope the committee will not be you know, dominated by paper people who really do not know. So... I agree with you, we are not a country that learn lessons. We are not a country that uh, try to improve on what we have. But we hope this will change for the betterment of everybody in the country. That, that is our only prayer. That's our hope. Thank you so much, Agri Captain Sadiq Shu, uh, security policy analyst for being on the state live.